we'll start in uh, a few minutes here. This is from my laptop. For our I mean, the next session starts at 10, so a little bit. Most, most, most sessions are in. Good morning and welcome to the panel on building blocks of trust for a sustainable evolving internet. Um, it is Thursday morning uh, here in Geneva uh, and we have uh, diligent attendees who uh, want to get the most out of uh, the internet governance forum this year and we appreciate that. Um, we have a panel this morning to talk about trust and um, uh, you know, the evolving internet, particularly as it relates to artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, um, and this confluence of connectivity and technology uh, that we all continue to live on, that, that continues to evolve. Um, I'm Greg Shannon. Uh, I'm the chief scientist for uh, the uh, CERT division at the Software Engineering Institute, where we do cybersecurity in that division. Uh, and I'm delighted to work with IEEE on the, as part of the internet initiative uh, that they sponsor. Uh, my co-moderator here uh, is uh, Ishrek Mars. Um, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Right. And uh, she's going to be co-moderating moderating with me. Uh, I do have to leave a little bit early to catch a flight. Um, so I apologize for that in advance. Uh, but Ishrek will shepherd us through uh, uh, once I leave. Um, Ishrek. So I'm Ishraq Mars, and I'm a software engineer and student. I'm the general secretary of the IEEE Special Interest Group on Humanitarian Technology in Tunisia. Uh, so here today we have um, Marina Rijari. Uh, is that right, the name? Sure. Okay. A full professor of telecommunication engineering at the University of Roma, and the IEEE 2017 vice president technical activities. Uh, we have as well uh, Ariza Emma, which is the assistant professor at the University of Tokyo and the visiting researcher at Wiccan Center for Advanced uh, Intelligence Project in Japan. And we have Danit Gal, uh, which is the ancient scholar at Peking University and the international strategic advisor at the e Center at the Chinese Tsinghua University and in, in Beijing, China. And yeah. 
so we will come out speakers. Yes, yeah, so the, the way we will run this morning is that each of us will take approximately five minutes uh, to make some comments uh, on the topic. Uh, and then we will have uh, 25 minutes for questions from the audience. Oh, I didn't automatically, thank you. Uh, I took a close look at the importance of trust in my daily routine. So my phone alarm today went off at uh, 5 a.m. It did not fail me. I did not betray my trust. I chose as well my outfit based on the day's weather forecast. So my trust in the, first, uh, in the forecast today also paid off. So I, I just like uh, remarked that in every step of our daily lives, we place a considerable amount of trust in, in technology, in people, in institutions. So um, I, I think like, like it's important to, to have trust on the, mainly in the online uh, stuff that we have in the internet, using the internet on itself. And uh, actually the online trust is a mechanical one because we are having trust in machines. And uh, just, as we trust, uh, just as we trust, for example, our cars and we are sure that they're not going to break down at any time. So um, the, uh, what I want to say is, um, I have like a uh, perspective concerning the, 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 our data w when using the, the, the internet, like our trust. For example, if people were, t were truly uh, concerned about their data, sometimes I'm asking why are they really like um, using the, 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 the media and the digital media at all? So like we have the, the privacy, uh, the, the, privacy uh, the data privacy and security in, in, in one hand and on another hand we have like uh, people are just asking about how can the application and the internet services and providers are, are taking their data and using it. So um, like many of them and many of internet users are, uh, are using online services and can be unaware of the, of the full extent of personal data that is collected and stored. So, um, so this is mainly what I want to say concerning the This is her first time as moderating, so yes, we're, we're, we're training new new talent uh, <laughs> in uh, uh, the uh, to have your first time to, to moderate at the UN. I think that's a, a wonderful uh, <laughs> wonderful treat for this. Yes. <laughs> so introduce the next or, uh, defer to the next panelist. Okay, so we move now with Danit. Mm -hmm. um. So I will be okay. taking this opportunity to talk about trust um, in technology through the eyes of what I've been seeing in China. And I think that the topic of trust in China is a very fundamental one because there is a very strong incentive for the government to cultivate trust. And I think that in a lot of the policies that it put out, the vision that it has for trust is to have social interaction and through that develop a sense of mutual trust. And there's a very interesting concept in that, in that they believe that through the technology and through robust and meaningful and, and kind of purposeful technology that provides services and convenience and helps alleviate a lot of difficulties that China still has as a developing country is a really sustainable path to creating trust. So in that sense, even when we talk about the social credit system, which is explicitly mentioned in its uh, next generation of AI development plan, people seem to think about it in the West in negative ways. But I think that from the Chinese perspective, this is actually a very meaningful and, and useful tool to cultivate trust between the government and between the citizens because it helps people keep everyone in check in the sense that the government keeps the citizens in check and the citizens keep the government in check. And there is this idea of having this mutual interaction through AI, and I think that also through the incorporation of blockchain technology to really help cultivate that kind of sense of mutual benefit and interaction. Now, I think that there is an interesting aspect to that from the industrial perspective, just because China is cultivating a very robust AI industry. We've been hearing a lot in the news about Chinese companies getting into the forefront with a lot of innovations and a lot of development. Uh, the example would be the big three, uh, Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba, but we also have really robust companies like iFlyTech and ByteDance and Face++ and others that really 
create these kind of technologies that help improve the situation for the, the, the society and for the public. And I think that through that instrument of having the technology as a connector between the government and the citizens, we could really hope to achieve a better interplay, a better future, a more attentive government to the needs of the people. Because if you think about it, China is a pretty big country. It has 1.4, almost 1.4 billion people. How do you interact with these people? How do you listen to them? How do you understand what their needs and wants are? So in that sense, there is a lot of optimism about the ability of the technology to really create that kind of connection and foster the kind of meaningful policies and government planning that could deliver better services and trust to the citizens. So in that sense, I think that the role of AI um, and technology in general in China is something that I'm very, very optimistic about if done right. And that means that we still have time. The technology is at a very early stage. But from my perception of the policies that have come out, and those of you who follow Chinese policies know that they come out about every couple weeks or so, so <laughs> there's a lot to read. Um, there is really a very strong, optimistic push towards the incorporation of technology to make people's lives better. So not just the very developed uh, cities like Beijing and Shenzhen and Shanghai, but also the villages and the provinces that have less of a, a developed infrastructure to kind of help them leapfrog and get to a better uh, living quality. <laughs> okay, thank you, Damit. So uh, we move to Ariza. Yeah. Uh, so hello. Um, so uh, I would like to um, discuss or introduce uh, the trust between the human beings and the robots or the AIs. So uh, when I was talking with my European colleagues, uh, she asked me what the main ideas uh, that has been discussed in Japan uh, considering the AIs and robots. Uh, she said that in Europe, the freedom or privacy autonomy is really important. And I think uh, in return to her uh, comment, I said that maybe in Japan, harmony or more, more like coexistence with the robots will be a very important thing. So, um, and uh, the coexistence, it's not like a dystopian way, like the people being, uh, um, um, uh, um, employed by the robots, uh, it's, it's more like a positive way, living together. So robots and AI contribute not only the efficiency of the, or the economic growth, but it is considered as a partner of human beings. So for example, uh, I would like to show the um, videos, uh, two videos. Uh, one is the robot hotel. Yeah, could you show that? Yeah. So uh, you see that he, this, hotel is a robot hotel and the reception and porter robot and cleaning robot are introduced and there's also a concierge robot so this is a reception robot and uh, it's introduced not only for the efficiency because um in 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 way they actually reduces the uh, employees to a third by introducing this kind of robot However, it also uh, has the, um, they, they focus is that somehow it substitutes the emotional labor of human employees. So it challenges the concept of hospitality, but it also um, it seems that the guests are welcoming this kind of robot hotel for the entertainment way. So thank you. And also, could you show the another, yeah. Uh, there are some researchers raise a concept called the minimally designed accompanying robot. So you can see this, this one, this is a robot that requires humans help to accomplish tasks. For example, there is a garbage robot uh, with wheels and it does not have hands or to pick up rubbish, but it just exists. And uh, it finds a rubbish and moves closer to it or like just moves around and it waits until some generous or gen some kind person finds the rubbish and put inside into the robot. Yeah, so you can see that. So the child is really um, interested in what, what is this, and uh, they, they actually wanted to find the rubbish, and then they, they hand it, and uh, they actually contribute to cleaning the rooms or uh, 
So it's, it's not forcing them to pick up the rubbish, but you know, with the collaboration of, of this, the robots and human beings and uh, this uh, minimal designed robot or the researcher said it's weak robot. So, oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> So it's, it's, you know, it's far from the imagination of like the very frightening robot. It's, it's really needs human beings helps and it's kind of like it requires a collaboration and it's, it's not just cleaning robots. So um, this, uh, this uh, garbage bin, uh, garbage uh, robot, it accompanies, uh, the, 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 the ac accomplished the task by collaboration with the human beings. So it's more like considering affordance of things and many Japanese think that creating trustworthy robots is essential to be accepted in the society. Uh, however, these adorable appearance and behaviors somehow disguise their invasiveness privacy. So for example, peppers will be introduced in the house and it, since it's really friendly looking and it's adorable, person tends to speak their personal information and uh, however, uh, it's collect their personal information. So uh, th this kind of like a collaboration between human beings and robots and uh, behind that there exists some kind of a certain like a responsibility or the privacy issues and autonomy issues as well. So, uh, and this leads to the creating users guidelines of AI. So Ministry of Internal Communication Affairs are currently considering to create the user guidelines to, so to, to consider about the user literature or like uh, uh, user responsibility of using this kind of technology. So it's not only the researchers, but also the users that needs to, uh, that users create and educate robots or AI. So in that sense, responsibility and transparency issues is also considered, uh, it's the users also have to consider that kind of issues. So yeah, that's what I would give you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we move to Marina, if you can give us your perspective on this topic. Okay, thank you very much and uh, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here at the United Nations. So uh, that's why perhaps I would like to start to say that to me, trust is not uh, a theoretical concept. And uh, I have seen this this year by chairing technical activities of Atropoli that basically means uh, chairing 39 societies, seven councils, almost 400,000 people, all the conferences, all the publications that you know, they come from there. So um, I see that the trust exists automatically when you have content. When you have no content, then you start asking if what you are doing is trustable or not. So we launched the three communities this year with new, through three new topics for IEEE. IEEE were never collegially there. Uh, and in particular, in these areas of food engineering, smart agro-food systems, this is one area, and one area about Arctic engineering, we created automatically trusted community, big community, people that never met and never thought to cooperate on this topic. So, the first equation, and I hope then you will ask a question. So I'm not giving the answer, but just I would like you to connect two topics, trust and content. And naturally, trust and internet are very related. So you see that if internet is a means of content, there is probably not a very serious problem of trust. However, we cannot consider, and in the trust approach, naturally there are things that have to be looked for and others that come for granted if you do the, the first uh, uh, in, in a good way. So responsibility and human centricity are the two areas that I think are essential for building trust in the net. And then if you do this, transparency is almost automatic. Again, because you are providing content in a, and in this way, trust increases and you can arrive also to transparency. Naturally, how we can deal with trust if we don't deal also with ethics and privacy? In particular in Europe, 
we have a very hard deadline, May 2017. This will be the day in which we will understand if we are able to comply with a very complex uh, 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 approach to uh, privacy. Uh, but again, I see internet as an opportunity. Uh, I'm not scared about internet. Uh, I like the technology. I like ICT. I am an ICT scientist. And I think uh, that uh, through the internet, uh, through ICT, we can show to the social communities uh, how we can really work uh, with ethics, uh, with trust, uh, and uh, in a way that respect uh, the laws about privacy in the different countries according to the different regulation. So this is uh, the second thing that I would like you to think about, question about. Third thing, uh, we finally found a way to be forever young. We, we have internet now. And uh, uh, think that uh, while I talk, the first people from Generation Z, the young people born between uh, 95 and 2012 that see millennial as very old people, <laughs> they are taking the first graduation. So they are there. So I have no fear because uh, this will be the generation who will lead the internet, who will lead uh, the content, uh, and probably they will have also a role in our society and they will lead something within our society. So we are forever young if we understand this content, concept. So three solicitation, trust and content, uh, trust, ethics, and privacy together and we all have to become Generation Z in mind. We cannot do uh, anagraphically, unfortunately, but uh, we can do as a state of mind. Okay. Thank you very much, Marina. So, um, if you want to... Yeah. Thank you, Ishraq. Um, what I find fascinating about the word trust is that uh, when you look up the definition, uh, it talks about how vulnerability is an important aspect of trust. Uh, it's about willingly making yourself vulnerable to another uh, and trusting that they will not exploit that, that they will uh, nevertheless uh, maintain a sense of security, privacy, resilience, uh, accountability in that interaction. And you know, to me, that's the opportunity of technology is to facilitate that. We, there's mechanisms to facilitate security, mechanisms to facilitate privacy, mechanisms to facilitate resilience, accountability. I think technology-wise, we have some challenges, but uh, there's there's ongoing research to facilitate that. So, you know, through my interactions with IEEE, I think the opportunity is to provide uh, technical capabilities that enhance trust. And where I've seen trust uh, experience, I mean. Uh, you know, as a chief scientist for uh, for CERT, CERT.org, um, you know, CERTs embody a, a big part of trust in terms of being uh, human centric. It's about building relationships to uh, in situations where uh, organizations are in a compromised or in a vulnerable position, uh, and you need to exchange technical information. You need to be transparent about what you're doing. You know, we develop the uh, uh, responsible disclosure. Uh, principle uh, that is used by many governments and many companies about how to uh, disclose vulnerabilities and, uh, and address them in a timely manner uh, to uh, uh, mitigate errors and problems in, in technology. Um, and so as, you know, as we look at artificial intelligence uh, and how that in robotics and autonomous systems, I think there's a couple of uh, things to consider. Uh, you know, I like the point about literacy for the users. Um, and I think helping users understand the choices that they're making when they are, you know, when they are choosing to make themselves vulnerable. Uh, I think one of the challenges is when we want to be able to give users the opportunity to say, well, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to use that technology. That's a, that's a hard social problem. Um, I agree with you, Danate, that it is a conversation between, you know, society and uh, government, society and industry uh, about how to, uh, how to balance that. Um, some of the research that's been going on uh, at, the, uh, at CERT, at the Software Engineering Institute that, I w that CERT is part of and Carnegie Mellon is the notion of explainable artificial intelligence. What we're finding is that users want to understand why an autonomous system, why an artificial intelligent agent is making a decision. So whether it's a 
uh, a uh, system that's uh, ranking loans, loan applications, uh, you want to be able to explain why the choice to accept or deny that loan application is being made. If you have a robot that's moving in an environment, you want the robot to be able to explain to the user what they're doing. Uh, if you can imagine being in an autonomous car uh, that's driving, you know, if the car slows down and you don't understand why it's slowing down, is there, is there, a, is there a thread? Is it just because it's making a turn? Is it because maybe it senses you like to look at this scenery and you would just like to drive a little slower to enjoy the view? Um, you want a system that will actually explain it. So I think that explainability is a key part of, you know, as, as uh, Marina said, it's, it's about the content. And so the, the explanation is part of the content that we're trying, trying to deliver. Um, so again, it's, you know, the other one final thought here is um, thinking about the future. Um, you know, the, the, the people who do trust in, uh, research trust uh, uh, highlight an, in, an interesting dilemma that we all face. Uh, every day, we each are trusting our future self to do something or not do something, um, which is an interesting concept. You know, what am I going to do in 10 years? Am I going to be responsible with the, uh, uh, you know, am I going to spend my money responsibly that I'm saving today and, and deferring? Uh, uh, deferring? Um, and so there's this notion that you are trusting the future in many ways, you know, at least in yourself. And I think with the, the, the various challenges of data breaches, of technologies being used in un unintended ways, we, are, we all are actually trusting the future. And those who control the technologies, who develop the technologies, who repair them, who maintain them, uh, with our trust that they'll be used well, they'll be used ethically, uh, they'll be used properly. Uh, and I think that part is one of the most challenging things we have is, uh, you know, we have, we can't control the future, um, particularly, but we all are vulnerable uh, in the sense of, of how ourselves move forward uh, in time. Um, so again, coming back to the technical, the technical capabilities that, you know, engineers uh, such as those in IEEE can provide, it's about providing security, privacy, resilience, resiliency and accountability uh, in order so that society can make uh, choices about how to uh, put these together. So with that, I conclude my comments and I would like, we'd like to now go to the, uh, 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 the audience participation session, though first I'd like the panelists, are there any particular questions or thoughts you have based on what we've said so far that uh, you would like to ask the other panelists uh, as part of this? Denise? Um, I really, really enjoyed what you said about the idea of explainability in addition to transparency because I think that we all know that just being able to see what is happening doesn't necessarily mean that we understand what is happening. And I just wanted to add on top of that that I would also like to highlight um, explainability and accountability on the side of the people who design and regulate the technology in addition to the users that Arissa mentioned. Because oftentimes, even if we understand what the technology is doing because it explains it to us, we don't understand why it was designed in a specific manner that allows us to enjoy the view or allows us to have this kind of extra security measure. Let's say, for, uh, for example, that we have uh, extra safety measures for children. So we need to understand why the people who design the technology design it in such a way, because at the end of the day, technology is not separate from human beings. We design it, we consume it, and through our consumption, it shapes the way we behave. And that is kind of a reinforcing cycle. So in that sense, I think that there is another interesting level of trust between the people who use the technology and the people who design the technology and the interaction between them. So in that sense, that's just a, another point of highlight that came to my mind where you gave your comments. Um, I would like to say to Arisa that the, the, the point that you uh, highlighted is extremely word-centered because I think that uh, human-robot cooperation uh, is exactly the way to grow the trust because, you know, um, it's true that we consume technology, but not all the people can understand the details of a design. So I don't see possible what you were saying, that uh, we have to understand how a thing 
has been designed. You have to trust it. You have to trust it because, for instance, there is a good IEEE standard behind that, just to talk about something I know very well, or because the human robot cooperation uh, has been grown ethically and uh, both humans and robots respect each other because they are both weak and both strong. So that's why I like your example of child and these uh, uh, smart garbage, but not enough to add the hands. Because this is exactly the environment we have to grow the trust. And uh, as the net and the ICT will be all AI based, uh, and after generation Z, uh, there may be another generation, but we finish at the letter, so I'm not sure which will be the name of this generation, that will be AI native. This means that they will see probably not a nurse, but a robot when they open the eye. And uh, for them, it will be natural to trust. So the future is much better than we can think about, but human robot cooperation is the point in which we have to invest energy. Uh, uh, we have to be wise enough to start doing the right things. So I appreciated very much your example. Uh, so thank you. Um, yeah, so I really um, like this kind of discussion. So what I think it's important is like uh, uh, you, you showed me, sh you, you, you said the example like explainable AI, but the, uh, as Danny said or like in the discussion, it's, you, you can't predict the unintended use of the users. So you, you can't explain all things or you can't write down all the IEEE principles or ethical, like what's the ethical thing. So um, so what I think is like to design the ecosystem or like the, the how the, um, how the, Technology is used, or like uh, how, how, like Danny said, what's the designer's intention, and uh, what we can do is like, uh, um, well, we have to explain first, and we have to descri describe what's what's the intention and uh, what's the expectation of the users. Uh, however, um, I think it's really important to consider. Um, uh, so, um, I can go uh, to. Uh, see how, how it is used and maybe um, you, you s do some kind of case study issues. So uh, it, it depends on the domains, like uh, what kind of AI is being used. Like it might be very different from like the automobile and also the medicine and the every scene. So I think uh, um, doing the user studies is also important to uh, see and also um, to do this kind of, uh, to see the trust among human beings and the robots. And I, I, I totally agree that uh, um, uh, you, you need some kind of trust between human beings and uh, robots or like uh, to the system itself or like this, uh, like the insurance system as well, not only the robot, but also the system, uh, the trust, yeah. Thank you. Um, Israq, would you, would you like to make any comments before we go to the audience? No, okay. Yeah. Oh, you, you do, okay. yes. No, no, I just have, I don't have Okay, so um, if we have any questions from the audience, yes, please back. I'm Deepak here. So Marina, you mentioned about the trust and uh, content, but what happens when you have a, a fabricated uh, false content like fake news, etc.? And uh, so that's also content, um, even if it is a, a with a malicious intent, maybe and how do we take care of that? Uh, so that's what I just wanted to check with you. And also I just want to mention one thing. Um, IEEE had organized an uh, event on tech ethics uh, a couple of months back, and one very interesting thing that we observed there was during the break we had uh, displayed short movies uh, on robotics. And in fact, it so happens that many of those movies were from Japan. But uh, there's a robofilms.com uh, or something like that, it's useful to have a look at those very interesting perspectives there. Thank you. Yeah, I think the question. Thank you very much. You brought up another key topic. Um, fake news belong to this uh, amount of data that we are very hard time to manage. Uh, you know, big data could be good, but uh, why they are so big? because we lost uh, completely track on two main things among the data. First of all, the information. So Claude Shannon would be not very happy about us because uh, we really spread 
the entropy information among an amount of things that we have a hard time to store and much harder time to retrieve. And even that is not enough. Uh, because uh, information is not all we need. We need knowledge. So you touch a base on a very important thing, the difference between data, information, and knowledge. And I think that the ICT community has a very important duty. It's called to go back on the information theory and to adapt the entropy uh, uh, approach, theoretical approach, so ICT scientists are needed in order to cope with an environment like the internet where user and source uh, interact but also interfere continuously. Fake news is a product of the interference. So when I talk about content, uh, in my mind, I am an ICT scientist uh, and I have a group that is working on this topic, uh, so I know that uh, Content is already the knowledge-based approach. That means that you have taken out the noise. So we have now a new concept of noise. There is not the channel noise anymore what should worry us, but is the self-interference. Because we could be, thanks to the net, uh, both sorts and the user of the same news. And this is very scary. So if there is something I'm scared about, is about uh, this confusion. And uh, I thank you very much for bringing up uh, this important topic. Very interesting. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Deepak, for your question. So um, if we have any other question from the audience. OK, uh, uh, any remote question? No, OK. Actually, we were talking about trust in AI, and uh, Arisa gave us uh, an example on uh, how in China they use garbage collectors, robots, Japan, and Japan. Japan. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, in Japan. Uh, but I on the other side, we also hear about uh, uh, AI robots, chatbots uh, that are racist, sexist, etc. So, how to solve this equation, like between the positive side on AIs, how um, how to uh, you know manage between trust and ethics? You see? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. So, Arisa? Do you want, yeah, who wants to take the question? Okay. Um, I think this also closely relates to the idea of fake news. I mean, when you say that robots become racist and sexist, it's not because they were designed to be racist and sexist. If we're talking about the example of Tay, what happened is, is that Tay was basically let loose in a way, and then it started accumulating a lot of data. And it didn't have any mechanism that allowed it to distinguish between good and bad data, and I think that the important thing to, to remember, even with fake news, is that data is flawed. Why is data flawed? Because people believe different than certain things, and that's what they express. Does it mean that it's not viable data? That is a reflection of who people are and what they think. So in that sense, if you say fake news, how do we counter that? And that's an example that I think could be very useful for that, is that um, platforms feed their algorithms fake news in order to teach them how to distinguish if news are real or fake. So the, the fact is, is that they actually give them more data to, to teach them the difference. And I think that this is a, an evolution that we're seeing with fake news that we're also going to start seeing with chatbots like Tay that is, going to be start, that is going to be fed certain data that says, you know, this data is classified as racist. This data is classified as, I don't know, positive or, or ambivalent or something like that. And I think that there is a learning curve that we're going to start seeing with algorithms that are being fed data and are learning, to are learning to distinguish between what is acceptable, what is wanted, what is something that could be discriminatory or offensive towards people. And I think that there are actually certain standards in the IEEE uh, P7000 series, which I'm closely affiliated to because I'm a part of the uh, initiative for, for ethics and also I chair a standard on that, that actually help distinguish or help develop methodologies that can really teach those systems how to distinguish between discriminatory or offensive data. It's a learning process. I think it's also a learning process for us. I mean, why is data so big? Because it, we just have so many people producing data, but now we actually have the tools to collect and analyze them. 
So in that sense, there is a very um, long learning curve that we as humans and also as developers and also as algorithms are going to have to go through to get to the point where we can actually take all these um, you know, large data sets and really try to shape them into something that is usable and ethical for everyone. I would like to add one more thing. So I, I totally agree with Danit. And also one more, one, more, one more thing I would like to add is that sometimes what is good but depends on the context and culture. So for example, um, in Asia, um, well, in, in um, Japan, um, sometimes people feel, thinks that it would be uh, better to uh, be protected and uh, somehow they, they give up the privacy. So it's kind of like uh, the, between the national security and also the, the, the depends on the privacy. So, um, and also uh, a similar thing occurs like, uh, I think you, you all might have seen some kind of Japanese animation issue. So they, they're sometimes, they're considered as cute or handsome, but in, in a way some, some, if seen from the Western way, it's sometimes too extreme or like, uh, too ghoulish or too, you know, it's a sexism way of talking. So it depends on the culture and, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm not a relativist. So there, 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 there should be some kind of lines that need to be um, distinguished to good or bad, but sometimes there's a gray zone and you have to um, not only um, say that that's not good from the Western perspective, but somehow you have to respect the, each culture's viewpoint, the histories and uh, what they uh, think it's good. So I think we need to, uh, we need the dialogue to discuss what is good, what is bad, what is um, obscene or that kind of issues. So I, I really uh, thank you for getting this kind of question. Um, Marina, if you have any comment on this. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, comment on this uh, last uh, uh, Risa's uh, words. Um, still, I think that we are seeing things from our viewpoint. Even if you are much younger than me, you are not young enough uh, for what is coming. Uh, so think that uh, we uh, personally uh, uh, was a child and uh, a teenager uh, in a country where the culture was very historically related. But now if I see my two son and daughter, they have three years apart, but one is a millennial and one is Generation Z. They are completely apart. And uh, the Generation Z, uh, that means always connected. So internet, smartphone is from, from, from the beginning of your life. You don't know a phone that is not a smartphone, okay? This means Generation Z. So what I think is that uh, we will assist to a process where the cultural difference uh, will become lower and lower. Why? Because we are included in a very uh, global tool. The net is the global tool and the society is influenced by the net. While at the beginning, the society was influencing the net. The fake news is the product of how we are in our society. But uh, if uh, we live on the internet, uh, and uh, the internet is the place, the cultural difference, uh, first of all, are better understood because we have more knowledge about everything through the net. But also, the global approach will make the difference become smaller and smaller. And as you were saying, we could find a very good basic uh, set of principles that are good for everybody. Then the small difference will be nice, but uh, they will not influence uh, the good, the overall good. But it's a process, and we are just in the middle of this process. That's my viewpoint. Uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Danita. Thank you, Riza. Um, actually, I have a question. Uh, like, if we talk about the future of, t of the internet and how, as we, as you said, the, the human centricity, the responsibility, and and just uh, like the, the transparency while using the internet and how to build the trust actually, how to build it on site, like what would be the role of uh, engineers, of institution, of, of the government? So, yeah. um, who wants to start with? Uh, what is the role of institutions and government? Like of each one uh, in, the, in the community and society. Okay. I'm also an educator, so I think that <laughs> this is a question we have to reply. 
Um, so naturally, not, not all the engineers, but let me say that the technical people uh, as a group have the responsibility of growing the technology in a way that is ethically aligned. That, that's why now we are developing uh, these uh, uh, 11 groups within Naturopoly that are working uh, uh, to create uh, the consensus-based approach that is uh, the, 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 the way for creating, possibly, a standard uh, in the future. But uh, especially what is valuable is the consensus-building approach that uh, means that people coming from government, academia, industry, uh, private citizens that are curious to participate to the discussion, sit together and think about. So uh, the main role for the technical people in the future is to have the ethically aligned approach from day zero of their design of everything. For a professor, this includes that when it goes in the class and teach, the content of the, of the teaching is ethically aligned. So if we uh, uh, do this approach for all the technical dimension, we will create a technology that naturally is for the benefit of humanity, is uh, by design. And this is the main role that technologies have to have from now on. Danita, um, So just, okay, I'm going to s sit here in the United Nations and say something that would probably counter, be counterintuitive <laughs> to, the, to the mission of the United Nations, so I apologize in advance. I think that there is a very noble ambition in trying to create an ethical baseline for technologists around the world. And I think that this is a very positive mission. However, um, being in different countries and speaking to technologies in, in really different cultures, I understand very clearly that what seems ethical for one may not seem ethical for the other. And I think that this is a, a very serious contradiction that we're starting to see in the ethical discourse when you really bring a lot of people from different cultures and different countries into the table, and one person says, I think this is ethical, and the one says, you know what, for me, that's not really a, an issue. I mean, I think that something else is, is much more pressing in that sense. And I think that the role that governments um, and industries and even society has in that sense is to really engage in that kind of conversation within their country, within their cultures, and try to figure out what is good and, and what is bad and what is desirable and what is not. And there has to be a system of checks and balances between the groups to really make sure that, you know, there is a, an inclusive benefit in that sense. And I think that the key point for me for joining IEEE is because they have that kind of technical baseline. So I think that even if you say that privacy matters more or less, I think that we can all agree on the very basic concept of safety. I think that we can all agree on the very basic concept um, that move around design, you know, because even when we talk about trust, how do you define trust? But if we talk about safety, there are actual procedures and actual technical definitions that allow us to achieve that. And I think that we can all agree that not compromising anyone's safety is something that is usable and is tangible across cultures. So in that sense, I would perhaps call more for the establishment of a technical baseline through which we could establish these kind of ethical differentiations that could really sit on top of that. Thank you, Danit. I have uh, to be a middle ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really difficult. Um, yeah, so I guess, um, yeah. It's not only the, uh, the, from the technical side, but also we need to think from the social science and humanities side. So um, it's sometimes, it, it, it's also challenging the, the, the basic concept, like, like Danit said, security, fairness, and uh, responsibility, accountability. So I guess um, to build the trust between the stakeholder is really important, but I think we need we, we need some kind of time, and uh, in that sense, we need some kind of money, or we need some kind of you know institutions that or uh, to support that kind of conversation discussion. And I think IEEE is doing very good uh, job of like creating that kind of uh, places that you could 
go and discuss the kind of issues. And uh, I think uh, many companies, many researchers, or many social scientists and humanities researchers want to discuss the kind of issues within themselves or with other stakeholders. But uh, first of all, we need to create the places so that they could go there, discuss, uh, freely, uh, without restriction, or like uh, without being blamed by the other colleagues, you know. Sometimes it's really hard to discuss ethical issues. Uh, um, um, so I think um, it's, it's, first of all, we need uh, to uh, convince the stakeholders that this is important, and also we have to create the places, and uh, we have to uh, assure them that uh, doing this, this this kind of discussion is required and uh, uh, we need to create this kind of global network hub and that kind of thing. So I think what we are doing in Japan is creating that kind of places, the safe place to discuss, you know. It's sometimes really difficult, you have, you know, you have your context or like you're from the government, from the industry or like from the, the researchers. So I think uh, it's really important to discuss that kind of issues uh, from your, from your individual point and from your your with your background and it's not d don't be blamed by doing saying such kind of thing. So I, I think we have one final question over there. Okay. Hi, this is Gonzalo for telefon for from Telefonica. I just wanted to provide a, a different view and maybe the video from the kids using the garbage cans gave me the, the a hint to it. I think that. The approach to technologies is more neutral. I think we, we saw with the kids that they were not afraid of that. So maybe the question is not that, that we should trust technology, but we should trust whoever is providing us that technology. I mean, is it the same that we have the service provided by a government or by company X or Y? I think it's not just a question of the technology, but the, the ones that is, is giving us use of that technology. And maybe the issue of trust is, is related to those uh, providing the, the technology, not, not, not just the technology itself. Thank you for your question. So, um, mm -hmm. who wants to start? If you want, you have any comments on this question? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I agree. Like, uh, it's not only the technology, but you have to also consider who actually creates the technology and uh, who, what kind, what kind of intention, what kind of design is incorporated in this kind of, kind of technology. So um, yeah. So I think uh, um, I, I I think that. Uh, So um, it's it's not only the um, I think it the same thing could be said not only the technology itself but uh, whether the the like like the Google or the Amazon so like uh, who actually creates that kind of platform is also have the like the similar um, uh, kind of structure of like uh, who's creating the technology who's obtaining the data and that kind of issue so it's really um, very. Uh, pervasive um, question and I think uh, what we, we have to consider, we have to focus not only the technology but also the background, the culture, who actually creates it and uh, yeah, so thanks for raising that comment. I, I certainly agree with you um, and I think it, it connects closely to the point I made before but I think that just when you said that, uh, another thing popped into my head is that there is a, a very, str and we should place a strong emphasis on, on the people who give us the technology and how they design it. But I think that we should also place a strong emphasis on how people use it. Because in the video, we saw that people were really excited, the kids were really excited, they wanted to find rubbish to put in, 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 the, in the smart rubbish bin. But then at some point, one of the kids pushed it and it dropped it to, to see what happens. And they were also blocking its way to see if it could progress or not. And I think that there's a very interesting point in how the kids experiment with that kind of technology and then really not just about making, you know, cleaning the street something that is fun, but also trying to really limit or like to, to test its, its borders and really try to see what happens if we drop it, can it come back up? Or what happens if, it, if we block its way, can it really find a way around us? And I think that in that sense, 
another interesting thing to think about is not just the intent behind the development and the distribution of the technology, but also the intent behind us using it and how we use it to perceive the world around us and really test to see what we can and cannot do in that sense. And I think that that's a really interesting educational experience because if you were to do that to another kid, you know, block his way or push him, he would probably start crying <laughs> and you would probably get into a fight. So having that kind of technology that allows you to test what happens when you do that without getting that significant pushback is an interesting thing that I think was going to shape a lot of our interactions in the future, kind of uh, in line with uh, what Marina said in the sense of how we're going to interact with technology and how that's going to shape the way that we as human beings develop and evolve. Uh, I think uh, that another trend that however is happening is that due to the softwareization, the technologist and the user are getting closer and closer. This is another trend. So someday you will be the one designing your uh, device, uh, assuming that your device will be still all external to you because it might be partly internal to your body. So the point is that uh, the user and uh, the technologist uh, may collapse one day, not immediately. This is a little bit more futuristic, uh, but this is the trend. So again, a, a place like the one that Anita was saying about a place that could be also Itropoli where the human and robot and the uh, robotize the human, because when we think about uh, implantable things, we are uh, thinking that we would become kind of robot inside. This place where the education on human robot cooperation, including self human robot uh, cooperation, uh, should be a place where we will fix that. And uh, it's an educational path. And we have to learn how to make education on this very special class, a class where you have human beings, robots, and human beings that are partly robotized. This is a, a place that we do not have in our imagination yet, but we have to start building it now because the AI native generation is the next one after generation Z. So be ready for that and thank you for bringing the point. Okay, so uh, I think it's already time to, yeah, our session came to an end. Uh, to an end. So um, I'm going to ask you if you have um, like any final thoughts and uh, ins insights, like the most interesting insight if you want to say. I'm, I'm professor, I can talk forever, so you continue <laughs> to ask me. I <laughs> no, just one last, last sentence. Internet uh, is our opportunity. If we miss uh, this opportunity, we will miss uh, uh, the opportunity to have a very good society for the future. It's not the opposite. The paradigm is completely reversed. Internet will, need, will be needed to teach the society how to work. So internet is our opportunity. Don't miss it. Exactly, that's the point. <laughs> okay, so uh, we want to thank you for, uh, for being here and we thank also our audience. And thank you everyone for your time, so.